Well, hello, good evening, and welcome to episode 86 of Fracking Nightmare. Now, this is quite probably the last episode of Fracking Nightmare before I get my day in court, as it were, or a few hours in court, as I uh, challenge Rathlin Energy's attempt to force me into uh, bankruptcy. And uh, of course, this is uh, my nemesis, as it were, in uh, Rathlin Energy, David Montague Smith, the uh, chairman of Rathlin Energy and the landowner at uh, Crawberry Hill, Philip Ellerington. And uh, of course, for the last, uh, uh, what, 21 months or so now, uh, Rathlin Energy have apparently been uh, pursuing me uh, to try and recover uh, some, I think it's nearly £50,000 worth of uh, court costs and, uh, well, and the eviction costs, the uh, cost of the eviction of Crawberry Castle back in August of uh, 2014. Well, um, I'd like to say that uh, I could tell you exactly when the case would be heard, but I can't. But I can tell you where it will be heard. The case will be heard at the Royal Courts of Justice. This is the Rolls Building at Fetters Lane in London. The nearest tube station is uh, Chancery Lane. And uh, all I can tell you at the moment is that uh, it will be one of these three dates. Either Wednesday 27th, Thursday 28th or Friday 29th of April. And I won't actually know until the... Um, case is posted on this website, which you can see on screen there. And uh, I have to check that website at two o'clock in the afternoon of each of the days to find out uh, when the uh, case will be heard. Now I have to submit the documents, of course, uh, on, I think on Monday, uh, pending the case potentially being heard on the Wednesday. But um, obviously it'd be wonderful to have a bit of support in the court. Um, but uh, I'm not expecting people to check on the uh, court website. So if you do want to uh, keep track of uh, when I have my uh, opportunity to express my opposition to being lumped with these costs, then uh, if you're not already following me, then uh, please do so on Twitter. And that's my uh, Twitter name, at Ian R. Crane, capital I, capital R, capital C. So, um, well, anyway, we shall see what transpires. But uh, Yorkshire, of course, is very much the targeted area. Of course, Lancashire has been in the media uh, over the last few weeks with the five week hearing uh, by the planning inspector into uh, Lancashire County Council's decision to reject Quadrilla's application to drill and frack at Rossica and Preston New Road. And now everyone waits uh, with bated breath for the planning inspector to submit her report to uh, Greg Clark, the Minister for uh, Destruction of Communities, and uh, for him to make his judgment. Well, if I was a betting man, then I would absolutely lay the odds on Rossica uh, being upheld, i.e. the Lancashire County Council decision to uh, not allow Quadrilla to drill there, that will be upheld. And the Preston New Road decision will be overruled. And uh, I'm pretty certain that, that decision was made a long time ago. And of course, what we've just been through is a total charade. Now, not suggesting for one moment that the planning inspector um, has uh, been party to that. I'm sure that she has done and will do uh, uh, the job that she is employed to do with the utmost professionalism and integrity. Two qualities, of course, which actually don't exist within uh, modern day politics. Well, if we look at the uh, map here on the screen, we can see that uh, effectively the British government has unleashed environmental warfare on the north of England. And uh, what we do see up in the, uh, the top left of the screen there, uh, we see the underground coal gasification licenses and again down around the, um, the D estuary. And of course, over on the Yorkshire coast. Well, interestingly, uh, literally in the last uh, few days, um, the Queensland government in Australia has announced that it will outlaw all 
underground coal gasification. Now, this is obviously as a result of the absolute travesty perpetrated by Link Energy. And a few weeks ago, we had Helen Bender as the guest on Fracking Nightmare. And of course, sadly, Helen's father, George Bender, uh, committed suicide last October, having fought with Link Energy for over 10 years. Well, Link Energy and um, a BG Group, uh, who were also drilling in the area. But uh, such is the devastation caused by the underground coal gasification. There's an area of some 320 square kilometers in southern Gre uh, Queensland, which is now considered to effectively be uninhabitable, certainly unusable for uh, normal agricultural purpose. And uh, for a little bit more information on that, then you know, please do search for Fracking Nightmare and Helen Bender and uh, you watch her very moving interview with me just uh, a few weeks ago. So um, George's life was not given in vain. And I'm sure that uh, George, wherever he may be, is uh, dancing a bit of a jig right now to know that uh, you know, despite um, him electing to leave this mortal coil, that uh, one abomination has been stopped. Now, of course, it's uh, keep on the pressure to try and shut down the continuing devastation of Queensland with the unconventional gas industry and their coal seam gas exploitation. So here in the north of England, um, it's uh, not rocket science that uh, basically the north of England will be totally transformed if this industry uh, does indeed achieve what it wants to achieve. And right now, the industry is unleashing a charm offensive. Well, the only thing that uh, uh, I can see is that uh, is really offensive is their fake charm. But um, there's an event in Scarborough next week. Uh, in fact, on Monday of next week, and uh, this is organized by the Onshore Energy Services Group. And the um, seminar is called The Future Business Opportunities of North Yorkshire Onshore Oil and Gas. Well, I'm sure there'll be plenty of business opportunities in the healthcare profession. And um, of course, in the environmental cleanup profession and uh, in uh, undertakers, probably. Well, here's the agenda. For anybody who uh, you know, is thinking that this would be an interesting day out, well, I'm sure it will be. If you want to see a prima facie example of cognitive dissonance, of uh, lies, deceit, and self-deception, then uh, look no further than uh, Scarborough Spa next Monday. And just to pick up on a couple of items on the uh, agenda there, we have the size of the prize. I mean, this is straight out of... Um, Zbigniew Brzezinski's uh, uh, ethos, the size of the prize. And uh, maybe um, I'm sure Ken Cronin has been taking a few leaves out of Daniel Yergin's um, uh, book. Um, well, that's Ken Cronin, the size of the prize, <laughs> really. Uh, so see what's coming, Yorkshire. And then we have um, Lorraine Allenson, who is the go-to person um, who is on tap to demonstrate that the community, the local community, is supporting of this industry. Uh, funnily enough, there doesn't seem to be too many people behind Lorraine Allenson. And as we saw in uh, Blackpool, um, the <laughs> evidence was that the uh, attempt to portray a pro-fracking community, they were all bought and paid for. They were all agency hires on an hourly rate and uh, who weren't prepared to stick around any longer than uh, the time they'd actually been paid for. And then in the afternoon, in the afternoon there, we have um, the four companies here, Ineos, Quadrilla, iGas, and Egdon Resources, and of course, uh, Third Energy, so, uh, five companies actually. Um, but one missing, of course, Rathlin Energy. Where on earth could Rathlin Energy be? Um, I guess they're probably wrapped up in uh, preparing the, uh, the court case, just the same as I will be. Well, interesting, an article appeared on the uh, Frack Free North Yorkshire uh, site um, earlier today. The investigation reveals Yorkshire fracking firm Third Energy's links to infamous offshore tax haven. 
and uh, you can see this article for yourself on www.frackfreenorthyorkshire.com. And here's the uh, only paragraph. An investigation carried out by Frack Free North Yorkshire can reveal the third energy. The company that has submitted a planning application to Frack at Kirby Mispleton also make use of these types of offshore tax haven where their holding company, Third Energy Holdings Limited, has been based in the Cayman Islands since 2011. In a building once described by USA, President Barack Obama as either the biggest building in the world or the biggest tax scam in the world. Well, <laughs> what a surprise. The vast majority of companies in the oil and gas industry are, in fact, registered offshore. And um, not least, of course, Rathian Energy, who are registered in Jersey. And take, a look, take advantage of oh, their investment um, funding, takes advantage of some somewhat dubious activity in sub-Saharan Africa. But uh, perhaps more of that in the courtroom. Anyway... We'll see. Well, this event obviously should be attracting a lot of attention. And um, you know, my good friend Dave Morris has put together this short video to let it be known that as far as he's concerned, this is his line in the sand. So that's the clarion call being put out by Frack Free Yorkshire. And uh, of course, Scarborough, right on the, the coast, just to the east of the North York Moors. So hopefully there'll be a number of people from Frack Free Rydale, from uh, Frack Free Driffield, from Frack Free East Yorkshire. And uh, hopefully a few people will make the trip across from South Yorkshire. Now, so here's, the, uh, here's a graphic that uh, is being bandied around. So please take this graphic, take it from the Frack Free Rydale Facebook page, share it around, and uh, let's get the uh, people of Scarborough to understand that uh, basically they're under threat. They're under direct threat as well from the unconventional gas industry. And if uh, Scarborough thinks it's got a tourist industry now, then um, it certainly won't have in a few years. I mean, you know, just go down to the Gulf Coast in Texas and uh, you know, see how many people basically go down there for their vacation. If you want to go paddling where there's globules of oil floating onto the beach, then uh, that's an ideal place for your vacation. So let's uh, take a look at, um, at Yorkshire. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to focus a little bit on... Um, uh, South Yorkshire, because I was in South Yorkshire last week. And so here we have, this is the area that I was in Barnsley doing a screening of voices from the gas fields. And uh, that area, let's uh, expand that area. And let's just uh, you know, start to take a look at uh, who the players are here. Because we have uh, Hutton Energy and Alcane, Celtic, Warwick, then Quadrilla, IGAS, and then INEOS. So South Yorkshire divvied up amongst these companies. And in fact, this pattern is pretty much followed right throughout Yorkshire. Now, this is an advantage as well as a disadvantage because it means that every one of these licensed areas will have to make their own separate applications, which is a tremendous opportunity, of course, for the local communities to get involved and resist those applications at every step of the way. And of course, INEOS is the one, without any shadow of doubt, that has the uh, most uh, financial stability of any of those companies. And of course, INEOS is headed up by uh, Jim Ratcliffe, 
We've got a wonderful picture here of, um, of uh, the facilities at uh, uh, Grangemouth, I believe that is. Um, so if you, you know, you're looking to transform Yorkshire into the land of uh, eternal daylight, um, well, just have a chat with John Jenkin or Brian Monk or John Reed uh, Carew um, in Queensland and they can uh, you know, give you an insight as to what to expect. Here's a, a wonderful graphic from uh, Frack Free Scotland. And of course, Jim Ratcliffe, he's actually a Yorkshire boy. I'm not 100% sure that he was born in Yorkshire, but uh, he was certainly educated at Beverly Grammar School in East Yorkshire. So, um, you know, local boy makes good. Uh, may be the case if you just look at his uh, financial situation since he acquired uh, many of the plants from ICI and BP, uh, formed the conglomerate of INEOS, but uh, he's now returning to Yorkshire to effectively turn it into an industrial wasteland. And if you want to see what he's capable of, you know, take a trip up to uh, Grangemouth and uh, take a look for yourself. And of course, as Quadrilla um, told us quite categorically from their website a few years ago, they had every intention of establishing something in the region of 120 pads in the file peninsula alone. So don't think for one minute that, uh, you know, this is going to be a single well site or a, uh, you know, one-off um, operation like down in, uh, in Dorset with which farm, which the industry is very, uh, keen to try to create the impression that it's just gonna be a single pad and uh, just like Witch Farm in Dorset, you know, nothing, nothing else than that. But uh, here's what it looks like in Queensland. And of course, if you transform that, transpose that into your neck of the woods, then um, in an area that is somewhat more densely populated than um, Southern Queensland, it's gonna have a marked impact. So, Let's take a look at Rathlin, but uh, we'll do that after the break. The Alternative View Conference presents AV7 Humanity Rising. Speakers include Ian R. Crane, Thomas Sheridan, Patrick Henningsen, Max Egan, Zen Gardner, Dr. Graham Downing, Willem Felderhoff, Field McConnell, Vanessa Beely, Michael Shrimpton, Fiona Burns. 13th to the 15th of May 2016, Horwood House near Milton Keynes. Book online at alternativeview.co.uk or call 0207-558-8869. AV7, bringing together some of the most inspirational agents of real change. Honestly, I've spoken at a lot of gigs, and I'd say this is the best gig that I've spoken at, just because of the lineup of speakers. And welcome back to part two of uh, Fracking Nightmare. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in a little over a week, I will be in court in London uh, facing the legal representatives of Rathlin Energy. Uh, not that I expect uh, David Montague Smith to uh, deign to be present, um, but uh, you know, why do you think it is that they have uh, come after me? Um, after all, I mean, this is a company that uh, is in, well, dire straits uh, financially. If you look at their accounts, um, but, uh, you know, they just got a, an injection of some 17 million, of which the source is proving to uh, be quite interesting. And we'll have to see where that leads next week. But uh, David Montague Smith, of course, uh, he is the chairman of Rathian Energy. Uh, this is the largest license in um, East Yorkshire just following north of the, the River Humber. And of course, um, regular viewers will be familiar that David Montague Smith 
is uh, also the chairman of the Campaign for the Protection of Rural England in West Northamptonshire, and in which capacity he actively used that role to lobby West Northamptonshire MPs to persuade the government to remove subsidies from renewables. Now, once upon a time, of course, this would be regarded as corruption. But under the 21st century ethos of you know, greed, greed and more greed, where integrity is an irrelevance, and in fact, it's unlikely that anyone would become chairman of a 21st century company if they actually had uh, any modicum of integrity. So here we go. You know, he uses his position to uh, lobby to benefit, effectively, the unconventional gas industry. Well, he's had a bit of a rough ride since then, although uh, Crawberry Castle was removed after the uh, hearing in uh, late July of 2014, um, under the pretext that uh, Rath Energy were desperate to get on the site and start their operation. But of course, the reality is that they actually never went back on site. And um, as we speak, the site is now returned to its former agricultural glory. So it's going to be interesting really to see what justification uh, Rathlin Energy have for you know, bringing the case in the first uh, instance. But although the castle was removed, and then subsequently the camp was removed from the verge at Crawberry Hill, the local community stepped up to the plate and the local community made it very clear to Rathlin Energy that they were not going to roll over, that they were going to make life very difficult for Rathlin Energy. Now, what we're seeing in Australia is legislation being implemented where anybody protesting against the unconventional gas industry may face up to three years in jail. And I fully expect to see something similar attempted here. The British government is beginning to realise, if it hasn't already, that uh, this is not a popular industry that it's trying to foist on the British public. And as we saw in uh, Crawberry Hill, then you know, the retirees here who um, quaintly named themselves the Jerry Activists were determined to protect the landscape and protect the ecology for future generations. And uh, effectively, they got a result. Now, go back to South Yorkshire, and uh, last week I was screening uh, voices uh, from the gas fields. Now, this film has been up on YouTube now for almost one year. It was uh, posted on YouTube on the 1st of May of last year, and uh, to date, it's had just over 28,000 views. And the statistics actually show that um, uh, people who start to watch it generally watch more than half of it. And uh, by the way, there is a, a shorter version that will be uh, published uh, shortly that was prepared by um, a member of the Green Party in uh, Lancashire. And it's an excellent 20 minute cut. So uh, I'm going to be encouraging people who don't have the attention span to watch a full one hour to take a look at the, uh, the shorter version. So 28,324 views as of uh, an hour or so ago. And um, uh, people are starting to realize that this film, this documentary, although it's now a little over 18 months since I filmed it in Southern Queensland, primarily, even of course, a lot of footage from um, Balkham and Barton Moss, but, uh, we had a, a tremendous audience at this event, and it's full credit to Andy Hemingway of um, Frack Free Barnsley for putting on the event. And this is a report that appeared, you're not going to be able to read that on screen, but um, you will be able to uh, find a, a, a link to it. It'll be on frackingnightmare.com and it'll be on Facebook. But this is an excellent article by Mike Cotton of the Barnsley Chronicle, and I have to say it is the best report of an event that I have seen uh, to date. And uh, his, there's a comment that he has here. It says, um, Ian's film focuses on a small number of residents in Australia whose lives have been badly affected by the fracking industry there. 
He insisted people in Barnsley concerned about fracking should not just take his film at face value and should do their own research about the potential dangers of fracking. Something he says the fracking companies are afraid of. Well, this is absolutely the key point. I can absolutely guarantee you will never ever hear anybody from Ineos, Quadrilla, from iGas, from uh, Hutton, from Rathlin, any of these companies, you will never ever hear them say, look, please don't take our word that this is completely safe. Go away, do your own research, and when you come back, we know that you're going to welcome us with open arms. No, they know you're not gonna do that. They don't want people doing their research. They want people simply to take what they say at face value, and they're employing high dollar PR agencies to find ways to obfuscate, to deceive, to smooth over all the problems that have occurred elsewhere and convince the general public that it can never happen here because we have robust regulatory controls in place. Yet, the Environment Agency and the Health and Safety Executive have effectively acknowledged that they neither have the expertise or the resources to regulate and monitor this industry. And we haven't even touched on the issue of waste disposal. And what these companies are hoping is that local communities and local authorities just don't have enough expertise or knowledge to actually address these issues. Well, as Third Energy have found out in Rydale and in Yorkshire, that is definitely not the case. And the key element, the absolute key element here is to focus on the small community groups. And it, this is a key issue because I still hear of people who say, we have to form a national organization. And I say to you, anyone, anyone who claims that we have to form a national organization, be very suspicious about their motivation because the reality is that that is exactly what the industry and the government wants. It wants to be able to pretend that by talking to representatives of a national organization, it's engaging in consultation with the wider community. That is absolutely not the case. So it is absolutely crucial that the community groups of which there are now, I did this uh, slide here, um, well over three months ago, and now there are well over 750 community groups and growing. And I have to say that South Yorkshire in particular is really getting it. It's really coming on board and community groups are springing up right across the area. And Ineos and Quadrilla and IGAS are gonna get a serious run for their fast dwindling money. So this is crucial. If I if <laughs> either check to see whether there is already a group in your community, and if not, maybe consider starting one up, or at least hosting a meeting, bringing people together, and maybe there will be somebody coming along to that meeting who will help you to start one up. In the ideal situation, every street would have its own anti-fracking community. And let me make it very clear, from my perspective, I'm absolutely focused on unconventional gas. So that when people say to me, oh, but you're just anti-oil and gas. No, 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 I'm not, I'm a realist. I'm a realist. We've never needed to use hydrocarbons in anything like the quantities that we do. But we're locked into a hydrocarbon driven economy right now. The industry, and particularly the, um, uh, the financial community, particularly the US, are desperate to protect the hydro carbon global industry because that's what's keeping the dollar afloat. Without that, the US economy totally tanks. And more and more people are becoming uh, aware of that. That's why they had to get rid of Saddam when he started trading oil in euros. That's why they had to get rid of Gaddafi when he announced that he was intending to trade oil in uh, gold. And so the US is not just protecting its oil supply, it's protecting the US dollar and the US economy. It's gonna crash at some point, it's just a question of when. And what they're gonna do is keep trying to plug the holes. Well, 
Regardless of that, we have to focus on what's going on in the realm that we can influence, and that is our communities. So Screen Voices from the Gas Field or any of the other documentaries that are out there, like The Truth Behind the Dash for Gas, um, Groundswell, take a look at all of these films. You know, hold regular film nights. Even if you get two or three new people along to an event, it's worthwhile. The more pebbles we drop in the pond, the more intellectual power, the more creativity comes into this community. And the industry has already proven that it really lacks creativity. It lacks the ability to think outside the box. And the more people that we have addressing this issue, the greater the likelihood that at some point they're going to realize it and they're going to get out of town. Well, you know, some of the uh, industry are on a high at the moment because they think that the price of oil is um, uh, in a bull market. Um, got just back over $40 a couple of weeks ago. Well, it's back under 40 bucks right now. But if you look at the three month graph, then you could be forgiven for thinking that, uh, yeah, this is something I really want to put my money in. But uh, perhaps you need to take a look at the bigger picture. And this is the situation over the past three years. And of course the red line, that's the point at which um, unconventional gas exploitation really becomes non-viable. There's no possibility of actually getting into any profitability unless the price of oil is above that line. And the OPEC countries know this and uh, they're determined to protect their market share. They've stated quite categorically that they will protect their market share in what they perceive to be the twilight years of a hydrocarbon driven economy. Unfortunately, twilight means 30 to 40 years or so. But the OPEC countries, particularly Saudi and Qatar, get Saudi with the oil, Qatar for the gas. They wanna make sure that they are the preferred and in some cases the only supplier. So um, in reality, it's actually still a bear market. Well, here's the deal. This is why unconventional gas uh, has taken off, uh, because certainly from the crash of uh, 2008, where the price of oil actually dropped right down to uh, 35 bucks a barrel, I think briefly it actually dropped under 30, but uh, you know, on average days trading, it was down to 35 bucks. And then of course, over the next um, uh, five years, it rose up to about $115 a barrel, but since then it has been tanking. And yet, despite the fact that the stock prices, uh, this is iGas, people will be very familiar, regular viewers here will be very familiar. Um, of course, uh, you know, we look back at the abuse that I was getting from contributors to the iGas stock forum uh, in that period where I was encouraging people to sell. And, uh, you know, if I played in that arena, then I'd have been going uh, short on iGas stock big time. But, uh, you know, hey, I have integrity, so I'm not going to play that game. Um, but you look at the price, you know, from the peak of $160, uh, I believe it was, uh, in January, 140 in July of 2014, and basically now wallowing down at uh, 15.38. UCOG, slightly different story, of course, because this has had the benefit of uh, dodgy Dave Lenegas and uh, uh, his um, marketing ploys to convince investors that there's more oil under the wheel than there is in the North Sea. Well, anyone still believing that, um, maybe you could uh, drop me a line because I have some nice beachfront property in central Birmingham that uh, I think you might be very interested in taking a look at. But uh, they don't give up. And this is literally from, I think, yesterday. The Gatwick Oil could boost the economy by 52 billion. Yeah, it's okay, good luck with that. You know, basically, uh, these PR agencies, they can come out with anything they like. You know, stick your finger in the air and go, yeah, let's come up with a number, let's multiply it by 70% because nobody's going to challenge it. And by the time everybody's lost money, well, we'll be long gone. And of course, this is the deal. You know, all these people involved in these companies, they know that they are effectively simply maintaining a vehicle from which they can draw their outrageous salaries. 
Many of them are in enormous debt. Rathlin Energy is a classic example. Despite the 17 million that got pumped into it recently, it's still looking at a negative position, negative net worth position of probably 15 million plus. They know that they are riding on borrowed time and when they go belly up, then they're registered offshore. So you know, just leave the mess for somebody else to uh, clear up. So wise up people, wise up. But uh, remember, Let's um, take a short break and uh, remember the words of David and Brian Monk, because the people who stop this are we, the collective we. If at this point in time you can stand in front of a, a, a drill rig and stop it from getting on, the easiest drill rig to stop is the first one. The hardest one will be the 10,000th. It'll be more than that though in the UK because you're doing shale over there predominantly. Shale needs a lot of wells, leads a lot of destruction, poisons a lot of water. If this gets the tiniest foothold, you know, you're done. So it's now or it's never. Don't think that you've got that long because it's now or never. So you either, you do it now, you stand up now, and you find something within yourself that you didn't think was there. You know, that's the important thing. You will be confronted by police. They wear their Kevlar suits, and, and, and it's a big intimidation thing. And you've got nobody in front of you. Keep walking, you go out this way, you keep going. Don't push back on her, keep moving. Now, if you can do it, keep going. Keep moving, it's up to the people of the UK to get their cameras in the face of the Kevlar security, the Kevlar police who are paid by the corporations. And we have to say, no, that's all it is. But it's more than just saying no at a meeting. It's intent, it's the intent of no, it's the knowing that you mean no. That's when you will be unbelievably powerful. You, you come out in numbers, if they see your grandmother and the mother and, the, and the, the child come out and say, we are not going to accept this, then they are finished. But that's what it takes. Don't sit back and think that anybody's looking out for you, it's you. Welcome back to part three. Well, I was just talking about the uh, financial position of these companies. Well, let's take a look at what's occurring in the US. Now, this is actually an article from CNN Money. It's actually a couple of months uh, old now. But uh, here was the observation that US oil bankruptcies have spiked by almost 400%. And the comment here is at least 67 US oil and natural gas companies, fracking, filed for bankruptcy in 2015 according to consulting firm Gavin Solomonese. That represents a 379% spike from the previous year when oil prices were substantially higher. With oil prices crashing further in recent weeks, five more energy gas producers succumbed to bankruptcy in the first five weeks this year, according to Houston firm Hazen Boone. It looks pretty bad. We fully anticipate it's only going to get worse, said Buddy Clark, a partner at Hayes and Boone and 33-year veteran in the energy finance space. Now, what is really interesting is that people who work in the finance markets tend to fall into one of two categories. They're either always bullish because they're always trying to get you to part with your money to invest in their stocks, because of course they make out like bandits on the commission, or they play a more balanced game where they will encourage you, if they think the market's going down in a particular area, of course, to go short, to take a short position and effectively make money through betting, betting on the stocks falling. And if you really want a quick insight as to how that works, then I absolutely recommend that you watch the film, The Big Short, because that is, it's almost an educational film in terms of how people can make enormous sums of money by betting that something is going to fall, something is gonna go down. And right now, of course, there's a lot of people making money in the US on the basis that the unconventional gas companies are losing 
market share. They're going into uh, bankruptcy. They're losing the revenue because they can't sustain operations at a price of barely 40 bucks a barrel. And that's going to happen here eventually. It's just a question of when. Like I've said, the origins of some of the money that's coming into this industry in this country is very dubious. In some cases, money is actually being laundered effectively in and through the unconventional gas industry in this country. And where it's not being laundered, it is simply Ponzi. It's simply a question of keep getting the money in to pay your, yourselves, the, the, uh, the chairman, the directors, enormous sums of money, whilst they know that they are just going deeper and deeper and deeper into debt. And then eventually when the creditors say, hey, you know, that's enough, no more money, they say, okay, and we just walk away. These individuals stand to lose nothing, absolutely nothing. They are bandits. They have no integrity whatsoever. But now I just want to finish tonight's program by reminding people that this might not be just about unconventional gas. It's now more than 18 months since I first mooted the proposition that there may be a deeper agenda. And that is based upon this document, Implementing Geological Disposal, the white paper published by the UK government in July 2014. Now on the basis that I have been, and others have been talking about this for at least 18 months, I incorporated the conjecture into voices from the gas fields. We have it on good authority that uh, DEC commissioned a third party to take apart the Voices documentary. And ultimately, when they considered the, uh, the report, they decided the best thing to do, apparently, was to simply ignore it. Well, if, if there was no foundation, if there was no substance whatsoever in this conjecture, don't you think that somebody might say something? But no, there is just absolute silence because they would rather work on the basis that maybe a few people know what the ultimate game plan is, but you know, it's only a few people and we can always uh, deal with them. Implementing deep geological disposal. The 100 year agenda to literally turn the UK into a toxic nuclear waste dump. And ironically, we've been focusing on Yorkshire tonight, but the uh, reality is that it is actually Sheffield University that uh, is at the forefront of this research. And uh, this is from the Sheffield University uh, website uh, from almost exactly a year ago, 14th of April last year. Bury nuclear waste down a very deep hole, say Sheffield scientists. And in the article it says, scientists at the University of Sheffield calculate that all of the UK's high level nuclear waste from spent fuel reprocessing could be disposed of in just six boreholes, five kilometers deep, fitting within a site no larger than a football pitch. Well, it could, it could, but you see if they did that, it's likely to create a cancer cluster. So the way in which they get around cancer clusters is simply to spread it right across the country, so there's no cluster. You know, everybody gets um, a fair share at uh, basically being contaminated. And, you know, the other issue here, and of course this was discussed at the time, um, and uh, unfortunately it occurred after we had uh, released uh, the voices from the gas fields, but um, here's a report from The Ecologist of 2nd of April last year, to dump nuclear waste, first they must dump democracy. In the last act of the dying parliament, MPs quietly voted to dump democratic planning processes to expedite the facility for the high level nuclear waste in geologically fractured Cumbria. Well, the reality is that um, they're not going to do that in Cumbria because Cumbria County Council basically said, you're not going to bury your waste here. You know, we've got enough problems with uh, Sellafield. Um, so, you know, you, you think again if you think you're going to do that here. So this article alludes to the fact that this vote was simply about overruling Cumbria County Council. It wasn't. 
This vote was all about removing all local authority participation in the decision-making process of where toxic nuclear waste is buried in this country. So consider, and it's a very important consideration, consider the possibility that the purpose of drilling a network of deep boreholes right across the northern England is to turn it into the northern powerhouse, literally nuclear powered, with nuclear waste being deposited under communities right across the whole of the north of England. Or as Lord Howell said, the desolate northeast. And then when he realised he actually got the location wrong, he said, I actually meant the desolate northwest. Well, the Tories have every intention of effectively turning the entire north of England into a nuclear waste dump. And if I'm wrong, then somebody say so. Because we've been making this observation now, like I said, for best part of 18 months. Now, either nobody wants to draw attention to this, and if they don't want to draw attention to it, then maybe we're uh, getting you know, very close um, to a nerve here. And this is a, a graphic I used in a previous, from a previous episode of a fracking nightmare of Amber Rudd, or Amber Rudd Elia, um, and uh, Francis Egan of Quadrilla. Because, you know, why would these companies, why would they keep investing these enormous sums of money in drilling boreholes, which the likelihood of them ever getting anything viable from them is slim to none, unless, unless, they knew that there was another revenue stream about to manifest. Well, the bottom line is that community groups are what is crucial to this campaign. Stop the well being drilled in the first instance, and you not only stop the unconventional gas industry from establishing a footprint in your community, you ensure that there is no possibility of that well eventually being used as a disposal facility for toxic nuclear waste. I so hope I'm wrong, but sadly, as time goes on, and we see the efforts that this government and this industry is going to, to ride roughshod over communities, somehow I think I'm closer to the truth than this government would um, really like to acknowledge. Which is quite possibly why in the London courts next week, they're going to attempt to apply a slap, as it's known in the US, a, a strategic limitation against public participation. Needless to say, obviously Rathlin think they that are going to uh, curtail my activities by driving me into bankruptcy. Well, all I can say, guys, is good luck with that. Well, that's it for me tonight. But um, next time I'm back, we'll know the outcome of the, uh, the court case. And please, if you have the opportunity, if you're living in the London area, to come along and uh, give a bit of moral support, because I will be representing myself don't trust anyone in the legal profession to represent me on something as important as this. So follow my uh, Twitter feeds at Ian R. Crane and I'll keep you posted as to when the case will be heard. So keep your fingers crossed, but uh, good night. <laughs>